we already have one way of dealing with categorical data, which is to use proportions. However, there are some restrictions there. Think about the way that you compute a sample proportion. For each individual in the sample, either the outcome of interest happens or it doesn't. That's two categories. If you have more than two categories, you're going to need something else, and that's where a chi-squared test comes in. Another thing that we did with proportions was comparing groups. We had confidence intervals and hypothesis tests for a difference of proportions. But what if you want to compare groups, but there are more than two of them? Then that's not really going to work, and that's another scenario where chi-squared tests are going to be helpful. The goodness of fit test. This will be useful if you have a single sample and a single categorical variable that has more than two categories. The way that the chi-squared goodness of fit test works is that you look for evidence that the model, which is essentially what's in your null hypothesis, does not fit the distribution of categories or the distribution of values of that categorical variable. And if you look at the way this works, it's called a goodness of fit test, but you're actually looking for evidence of the opposite. Because if you look at those hypotheses, it looks like the null hypothesis says good fit and the alternative hypothesis says bad fit. That's pretty accurate. That is the way that it works. And you are looking for evidence that the model doesn't fit. That seems like it clashes slightly with the nomenclature, but that's just what they're called. We're not going to do a whole lot with this, but I wanted to have it in here for completeness's sake, the conditions for inference. Firstly, you have to have categorical data, which in a way goes without saying, but that does need to be in here. The second thing is that you want the counts to be independent of each other. The easiest way to make that happen is to take a random sample and collect your data from that. The third thing, all of the expected counts or expected cell frequencies, those terms are interchangeable, need to be at least five. This is similar to the success-failure condition for proportions that we had in Chapter 6, where we need the number of successes and the number of failures to both be at least 10. The way that you compute a test statistic for a chi-squared test is a whole lot different than anything that we did in Chapter 6. For every category, you're going to have two counts. There's an observed count, which is the value from the sample, and then there's the expected count, which you get based on the null hypothesis slash model and the sample size. Essentially, you take the relative frequency from the model and multiply by the sample size to get the expected count. Then for each category or for each cell, you can get one of those quotients, observe minus expected quantity squared divided by expected. Then you add all of them together, and that's your test statistic. One thing that I want to point out in the notation, immediately to the right of the TS, there's a thing that looks like an X being squared. That's a lowercase Greek letter chi. So that's chi squared in notation form. Toward the bottom, where there's that note, there are a couple of ways for the test statistic to become big. It'll become big if there are a lot of categories, because there's no way to end up with a negative component coming out of a cell. Since if the numerator is squared, that's going to be positive, and the expected count is a count, it's not going to be a negative number. So every component of that sum will not be negative. So if you have a lot of categories, you're going to get a test statistic that's big. The other way to get a test statistic that's big is if you have a few cells, or maybe even just a couple of cells, where the observed and expected counts are kind of far apart, because then you're going to get big numerators. That would happen if the model fits the distribution poorly. So there are two ways to get a big test statistic, and ideally we'd want to be able to differentiate between them, because that second bullet point at the very bottom would imply that we should be rejecting the null, but the first one doesn't. So we want to be able to tell those apart. Fortunately, the distribution that we're going to use to compute the p-value adjusts for the number of categories, so we will be able to differentiate those things, and we'll know which one's going on. To compute the p-value of a chi-squared goodness of fit test, or really any chi-squared test, you use a chi-squared distribution. Chi-squared distributions are right-skewed, which you can tell looking at the picture that has the two chi-squared distributions in it. They become broader as the degrees of freedom increases. You can see that in the picture. The curve with 9 degrees of freedom appears wider than the curve with 5 degrees of freedom. The mean is equal to the degrees of freedom, and the mode, which is where the peak would be, is at the degrees of freedom minus 2. That you can see in the picture. The curve with 5 degrees of freedom, its peak is at 3, and the curve with 9 degrees of freedom, its peak is at 7. And when you're computing the p-value, it's always a right tail. The way that the test statistic is computed, it's always going to be positive. So the p-value is always going to be a right tail. It'll always be the chance of obtaining a test statistic at least as large as the one that we got.
In this example, if you look at the initial text, the first sentence is the model, that 40%, 35%, 15%, 10%, that's the model that we're working with. Then we have the sample data in the next sentence. And then the third sentence, we want to determine if drinking patterns have changed. So the null hypothesis is that that 40, 35, 15, 10 model still works. And the alternative is that it doesn't, that the drinking patterns have changed and that model is no longer relevant. I put the conditions for inference in there. We do have categorical data. It does say that it comes from a random sample. And to check and make sure that all the expected cell counts will be large enough, you just really have to check the smallest one. And the smallest one would be the one with the smallest percentage. So that's milk. 10% of 50 is 5. That's at least 5. So they're all going to be at least 5. Then the hypotheses. The null generally would be that the model fits. So that model, based on historical data, that, that still works. So that would be the drinking patterns have not changed. The alternative, the model no longer works, that would be the drinking patterns have changed. To fill in the expected counts or expected cell frequencies, you just have to use those percents and multiply by 50 because that's the sample size. So the model said that over time, 40% of the customers ordered coffee. 40% of 50 would be 0.4 times 50, which is 20. The model said that 35% of the customers over time ordered soda. 0.35 times 50 is 17 and a half, and so forth. That's how you get those four expected counts. You just take those proportions and multiply by the sample size. That table with the observed and expected cell frequencies in it, that's a relatively common thing to have. Because if you have the observed and expected cell frequencies set up in the table, it's easy to put the test statistic together. Because then you basically go column by column to get the individual components. So I have four categories, coffee, soda, tea, and milk. So my test statistic has four components added together. And then I'm just going through them one by one. Our observed count for coffee was 22 orders. The expected number of orders, our expected count is 20. So 22 minus 20 quantity squared divided by 20 works out to be 4 over 20. And then you do the same thing for the other three categories. And eventually you end up with a test statistic of 1.429 rounded to three places. Then computing the p-value, there are four categories. So the degrees of freedom would be the number of categories minus 1. So here it's 4 minus 1, which is 3. Notice the 3 in the degrees of freedom box on my screenshot. And then we have to have 1.429, the test statistic, as our cutoff. And for any chi-squared test, it's automatically going to be a right tail test. So I selected right tail in the upper left and then specified the cutoff as 1.429. And I'm getting a pretty big p-value of 0.699. And then the conclusion, the p-value is larger than the significance level, so the null hypothesis should not be rejected. That part works just like it would before. If the p-value is less than alpha, you reject the null, otherwise you don't. So since the null hypothesis is not rejected, there's insufficient evidence to conclude what's in the alternative. So more specifically, there's insufficient evidence to conclude that drinking patterns at the diner have changed. That last part, the formal conclusion part, that works the same way that it did before too. If you're rejecting the null, you have sufficient evidence to conclude what's in the alternative. If you're not rejecting the null, you don't have sufficient evidence to conclude what's in the alternative. In this example, there are a couple of small differences, like the number of categories is larger and the subject matter is different. The one thing that's worth noting is the way that you compute the expected cell frequencies or the expected counts here. It's actually less work than in the first example. So we have this sample data about which donut people picked, and we want to perform a hypothesis test to see if position has any effect on donut selection. The null is that it doesn't, and then the alternative is that it does. Now, just from that wording, it might not be obvious how that null hypothesis gives you a model. However, if position has no influence on donut selection, then all positions are equally likely to be chosen. So the expected counts should all be the same. And since there are 150 people picking donuts and there are five positions, then the expected count or expected cell frequency for each position should be 150 divided by 5, which is 30. That's the part that's different about this example, where it's one where the null hypothesis implies that all of the expected counts are equal. When that happens, effectively, you don't have to do as much work, at least not for that part. The rest of it's going to be about the same.
again, having that table helps to put the test statistic together since then you can go column by column to get those five components of the test statistic. And then you simplify it and eventually you get 20.267, which looks big. And that's because it is big. Look how far out on the tail it is. Granted, if you had a lot of categories, if you had 15 categories, then maybe 20.267 isn't that big. But we only have five categories here. So five categories means we're going to have four degrees of freedom. And then right tail, since for any chi-square test, it's automatically going to be a right tail test. And then my cutoff needs to be 20.267. So I'm getting a really tiny p-value of 0 0.00044. For the conclusion, the p-value is less than the significance level this time, so we're going to reject the null, and there is sufficient evidence to conclude what's in the alternative, which is that position does influence donut selection. I wanted to point out how to use stat key to get a p-value for a chi-squared distribution. The option that you want is right here. It's the chi-squared option under theoretical distributions. Use that rather than anything under more advanced randomization tests. If I click on this, it'll prompt me for the degrees of freedom. I'll do the one for the donuts. Four degrees of freedom, and then you want a right tail in the upper left, and then the cutoff was 20.267. There's the p-value of 0 .00044. We can go through the diner one, too. The degrees of freedom was three, so I'll just change it here. And then right tail in the upper left, and then the cutoff should be 1.429. There, 0.699. That's the p-value that we had for that first example about the drinks in the diner. 